10 years ago, I, you know, so I, I was raised in a conservative Christian environment. Um, it, was, it was a good, it was actually a really healthy con, uh, church environment. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know any gay people. I didn't care about the topic of homosexuality. But, you know, 10 years ago, somebody came to me and said, hey, you, you, you seem to like controversy. <laughs> you can Google me later. Um, you, you should write a book on homosexuality. And I was like, why? Like, Bible says it's wrong. The end. Like it would be a, a one-page book. <laughs> but then I, you know, I was teaching at a Bible college, and so I was getting some questions from younger, young, you know, college students, and, and they were asking really good questions, like, well, "Where does it say that? And what about this? And what about this? You know, person that says something different? And what about this verse? And what about?" They're pushing me on it a little bit, like, "Well, well, do you know for sure?" And I said, "Well, actually, I don't, because I just always assumed the Bible said, blah 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 about homosexuality. It's wrong, you know, and that was it. But I've you know, I've never actually looked into it for myself. You ever, you ever have those moments where you know what you believe, but not why you believe it? And so I said, okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to understand what the Bible says about this. So I got all these books and commentaries and, and dictionaries, and I just wanted to comb through the whole Bible and, and, and understand what does the Bible actually say about homosexuality. But early on in my, in my you know, scholarly journey, I, I looked up from my books and I was like, you know what? <laughs> I don't have any gay people in my life. And when I'm studying something that's ultimately about gay people, like that, that might be, I might need to fix that. But here I am, a, you know, I, I'm teaching at a Bible college. I'm, I'm living in a, in a pretty cr- Christianized town. Like when you go to Starbucks, everybody's reading the Bible. You're like, gosh, I got to go to like a dive bar to be around, you know, non-Christians or something. Um, <laughs> So I'm like, all right, you know, I'm homeschooling our kids, or, you know, so I'm like really insulated with, you know, my Christian environment. Um, and so I, you know, I, I'm sloppy. I don't know what to do, but I, I, I just, I, I, I wanted to get in the lives of gay people so that I could humanize this conversation. So I, you know, meet somebody and say, you know, my, my, my name is Preston. I'm, I'm a Bible college professor. I'm studying the issue of homosexuality. And you look gay. Can I bu- buy you lunch and hear your story? <laughs> people are like. <laughs> <laughs> that's descriptive, not prescriptive. You know what I mean? Like, don't write that. That's not, I'm not saying that's good. I'm just saying, like, I, I just didn't know. I was so ignorant about so many things in this conversation. But I truly, truly, truly wanted to simply hear people's stories full stop. And the people I started meeting didn't believe me. <laughs> like, yeah, right. Wait, you're a Christian? You just want to hear my story? <laughs> yeah. I've never met a Christian that was kind to me, is what some people would tell me, let alone just want to hear my story. What's, what's your real angle? No, no, I'm serious. I just want to hear your story. Long story short, man, I, I would sit down with person after person after person simply to hear their story. And several things happened. Number one, my stereotypes were just obliterated. You know, when, when you're not around actual gay people, you, you, you just have the stereotype that's been fed to you, you know, about all gay people are just like this. They all have an agenda. And I met some of those beautiful, wonderful people that no longer were just a object of study, but became my friends. And in the midst of all the diverse stories, there was a common thread woven throughout almost all of them, and it went something like this. Well, you know, Preston, I was, I was, I was raised in a church. I grew up in a church. In fact, I was a, a, an Iwana champion in 1992. I still have the, the, the vest with all the patches, you know, whatever, the sword drill, right? Got saved at summer camp every year. <laughs> I said, well, what happened? How'd that church experience go for you? Well, yeah, mm, didn't really work out well. Well, well tell me about that. How, what, why didn't that work out well? And story after story after story, what I heard was not a scenario where this person grew up in the church and was was surrounded with loving people who dignified them, humanized them, and then when they they came out and said, you know what, I think I might be gay, I'm really wrestling with this, uh, my sexuality, I'm trying to figure out, okay, what does the Bible say? And people lovingly and graciously said, well, here's what the Bible says, you know, but hey, we will walk with you, we, we, will, we will love you, we'll be here for you. And if, 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 if it comes to where you just don't really want to follow the Bible, we will still love you. Like, we're, we're not, like, we can have that disagreement, 
but we want to help you on this journey. I, I've never actually heard somebody tell me that kind of story. My friends were mocked and ridiculed. Or, or they would just overhear the silence. <laughs> Sometimes silence can be really loud. Or they would overhear nothing but the negatives. It's wrong. Repent. Boycott this store. Protest that. Forward this email in all caps. Negative, negative, negative. One of my friends who grew up in the church says, to be gay in the American evangelical church is to be dead. You're an outcast, an orphan, a refugee, a diseased person. My other friend, uh, Leslie. Leslie. Okay, so Leslie, uh, who grew up, again, with gender dysphoria, when, when, when Leslie was a teenager, she remembers her pastor preaching a sermon series on homosexuality. And, and this is how Leslie recalls that sermon. She says this, My pastor began a sermon series that included all the evils of homosexuality. He condemned all homosexuals to hell. God had no forgiveness for such deviance. Even worse was the mentally ill trans community. These people were an abomination to God's eyes. In God's eyes, we must protect our children from their evil ploys. My friend and my friends, Leslie said, my friends were shouting amen and showed the appropriate levels of disgust. And I was ashamed that I was such an abomination to the God that I adored. Not that she was like shaking her fist at God and God's shaking his fist back at Leslie. Leslie's like, I love you. I want to follow you. Whatever it takes. I, don't, I, just, I, I want to live my life for Jesus. And what she's hearing is that that's impossible because she is intrinsically unwanted by this God. And so I asked Leslie, what did you do in that moment? She says, well, I went to the pastor I went to him after, went to his office and said, hey, here's my, here, I'm wrestling with this, this I feel like I, I'm carrying around the wrong body, I, I, I'm attracted to the girls, I don't know what to do with that, and, and, but I love Jesus, what, what, what do I do? And the pastor opened the back door of his office and said, I want you to leave my office right now, leave this church, and I never want you to come back here again. And she didn't, Leslie never stepped foot in a church for another 18 years after that. You see, we can, we can get the Bible right. Or let, let, me, let, me, let me say that stronger. I'm a Bible professor. Like, that's, that's, that's what I do. Like, I, I love the text of Scripture. I believe if, if God, the God who breathed the stars into existence breathed out his word, then we have no other option than to follow what God says. Full stop. So we, we need to get the Bible right. But if we get love wrong, we are wrong. Because truth and love are not at odds. If you are not being loving, you're not being truthful. And if you're not being truthful, you're not truly being loving. And, and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about um, uh, love the sinner, hate the sin. Okay, you've heard that phrase before? Yeah. I used to like it. I used to, actually, I, I used to really like that phrase. It was on my refrigerator for a while. Not really, but. And, until years ago, a gay friend of mine said, okay, Preston I, Preston, I got a question for you. Why is it always a straight Christian using that phrase towards gay people? Why is it always one directional? <laughs> like, straight people, those of us who are you know, attracted to the opposite sex, like, well, we got it all figured out. Like we're, sit, we're standing over here in our, in our ivory tower of glowing with straight, straight righteousness, you know, and look, looking down at all those poor gay people like, oh, you know what, you sinner, I, I hate your sin, but you can thank me later, but I will love you anyway, you sinner. I love you, but I hate your sin. Try that in a marriage relationship. Honey, you're such a sinner, but it's okay. I will love, I hate your sin. But I, I will love you anyway. It just has such a condescending, self-righteous scent to it. Instead of love the sinner, hate the sin, let's love the sinner, hate our own sin, and invite other sinners toward, to walk toward the only one who is without sin, because at the foot of the cross, we are all broken in our sexuality. And so we need to approach this conversation with that kind of humility and addiction to God's grace. 
Because we are all in need of it, equally. Or as Paul says, I love what Paul says in Romans 2, 4. It's the, it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. I, I long for the day when, when the church, and I don't mean this church. I mean big C church, general church, churches in general. I long for the day when the Christian church in America has a rep- reputation of just radiating with kindness. Not, not slack-jawed, you know, niceness. I'm talking theological kindness, the kindness that God showed to us through his son, Jesus Christ, who looked at us and said, you are a sinner and that's why I love you. I came to seek and save the lost. Most, at least in my experience, gay people, trans people, when they think of the church, they typically don't think, church? Oh, kindness. Again, not just, not theologically anemic niceness. I'm talking embodying that radical, scandalous grace of Jesus in a world that is longing for that. 